but Hydration has traded out now on the 5v5 and Super's looking for the MTD. It's dead! He's the one that gets the MTD! Jangu brings it down. Shatter, Super, absolutely furious. They have one fight to repeat the reverse sweep. There's gonna be two Blizzards in the fight. I'm looking at those right now. Let's see how they're employed. May the better team win. Jungu's hit with a body grenade early. That's a very early immortality field as well. Could be dangerous, but there's a Blizzard there now getting thrown down. Jungu, Shatter. Oh my god! The outlaws have done it. We thought they'd be kissing the ring. What's going on, everybody? It's Frito here for your Overwatch. Today, we're going to break down the replay of the match of the week in the Overwatch League, the Outlaws taking the shock to six maps and ultimately beating them. This series was amazing because there was so many meta plays as well as meta mistakes that we can learn from and emphasize. The first rollout here, like many things in this game, wasn't really caught on the stream. It was hard to tell they were even doing this. But what happens is they end up flipping this rotation and utterly counter-stratting the double spam setup of the Shock. So what the Shock want them to do, playing Symmetra and Junkrat, is to walk into these Sim turrets and come right in this choke and get hit by all of the projectiles. Instead, the pathing of the Houston Outlaws goes around the entire map to then fight here, which is a bit more open, easier to duck away from the spam, and possibly most importantly, dodging these sim turrets and they set up hydration up on the top which is going to be one of the most deadly places to launch your doom fist from remember this meta the main thing you have to worry about is finding ways to convert your damage into eliminations. The other option, of course, is denying the enemy's damage. That trade of who gets more value is what's going to result in an elimination in the mid fight before there are the big tank and support ults in play. So at the start here, the shock realize that their plan is now getting completely beat just by where the Houston Outlaws rolled out on. They know the insta-kill Doomfist is up top, so FD God goes up top in order to try to deal with it. Choi as well is going to respond to try to mark it, but neither of those characters really want to fight the Doomfist either. So because of that, Jangu knows that we can swing on the Sim and the rush comes in to overwhelm the Symmetra. You see, the thing with the Sim pick is that she is the glassest of cannons. Yes, she got more health before uh, in previous buffs, but that doesn't necessarily help as much as you might think because it focus fires all you need, right? So from Tayo's perspective, he needs the help of the Peel characters, D.Va and Lucio, to even stay alive at all. The boop from Lucio is going to stop the Ryan swings as well. D.Va can boop a little bit. Matrix can stop the damage. Ideally, what Tile wants is the protection around him in order to charge up to tier 3 charge. But the play happens so fast that we're not even going to get to tier 2 charge before Tayo is just destroyed. It's like, boom, there's the open target, go. What have we been talking about the past couple weeks in our meta breakdowns? You see the open target, you go cash it in. Ryan Hammer can do that, but the ebb and flow of resources should deny it from happening more times than not. So... As we'll go through this series, we'll find some of the biggest examples of those counter strats coming in, but I don't know how I rate Symmetra at all up against uh, the Doomfist double stun comp. Um, if you have the D.Va on your side, I just don't think you're going to be able to keep the Sim alive. Tile seems to agree and moves on to the McCree, but now we're going to see an interaction where... It's up to the team overall, but also the McCree to win the stun trade. Look where Hydration keeps launching from, and a combination of things is happening that this shock setup is just too slow. The team that takes the initiative and finds the early tempo advantage typically is just going to win. One of the biggest tempo advantages you can get is an Earth Shatter because the ability charges so darn quick. But you see, both teams have a similar plan in mind. Put the window on the corner and then use it to do more damage to the enemy. But look at the contingency plan here that wasn't even captured on stream. That's what a cool thing to me. Super is gonna get caught in the fire strike animation right at the end of it. He was just about to be able to get his shield up, but Jangu outplays him, reading that this window fire strike combo is gonna come through. Shatter goes through the whole team and that's just gonna win the team fight outright. But there was multiple ways that Houston with their aggression could have won this fight. Even if the Shatter gets blocked and the value of both of these windows is kind of neutraled out, like equaled out from both sides, the launch from Hydration could have got value. 
But more importantly, the sneaky McCree Flake way out in the back could have also carried this fight. And he'll get guarantee that the fight is confirmed. And that's the power of flanking right now in this meta. And, and part of the reason why I think Overwatch is in such a great state is that, okay, so we get value here anyway, uh, ends up not mattering. But even if the play on the front line went poorly, this play has value because there's only so many resources to stop that frontline play that by the time this flank from Happy comes in, he will get value too. Like he's put himself in a position with the mega health pack behind him that even if the rest of his team fails their play, he should be able to get one to two kills and heal himself with the mega health pack to secure this fight. Which is why I think just in general, the Houston Outlaws are really seeing how to play this meta in the correct way. Now, rantering back into the fight now, we're going to try to find out if our DPS were getting set up from the Shock's point of view. Are they ever going to be able to find value? And here's the problem. When Houston plays this aggressive on the transition of as they're trying to take space, they never can. Where did Tayo ever have a shot to hit? Well, the pathing was punished here by the aggression of Houston taking matters into their own hands. If you remember back to my uh, meta video where we broke down trying to interrupt the pathing of the retaking team, that's what's happening here. Look how sloppy this formation is. Violet and FD God think they're the aggressors, but really the aggressive play is being set up together behind the shield, right? This is the type of formation, a thing that it doesn't get talked about in Overwatch enough, but is like make or break for the Overwatch League level, but something you really can care about a lot for your own games. Are you in formation with your team, right? The squishies are the most vulnerable to the high noon, so it's most important that they are in formation to be saved by the shield and defense matrix. But as if they were anticipating Houston to be passive, they come on this angle to try to punish from here, they get caught out by the whole team already being here from the Houston Outlaws. So this high news is going to get two kills for free. So it's a combination of the team just not being in sync and where they want to go, right? They're trying to send a DPS uh, to white to possibly see something. But at no point does Tayo even get a chance to interact with this at all. He's not going to build ult. He's not going to be able to confirm a kill. And the things that the Houston Outlaws can use to confirm kills or just easily see their target. Squishy's dead, boom, instantly in a second, just by pointing it in the right direction. And then furthermore, Tyo's just gonna have a, a, a real hard time adapting to the Doomfist. And if you find yourself playing against more Doomfists now that he's been uh, featured in the league so much, I'd suggest try to get your tanks to be on one of two heroes. In ranked, I think Hog is a pretty easy answer because he kind of can solo him a bit, but also, Zarya is better than D.Va in my opinion because Doom wants to go for an all-in engage which means if you save Bubble for when that happens well all his cooldowns kind of get deleted. Now you might not be able to farm energy as easily but you will be able to kind of counter this. Kind of weird uh, why Hydration was able to live there against the stun. Did you notice that? Well, it turns out the tank line on these aggression uh, uh, pushes is the reason why and this is why I mean you need Zarya because the aggression can be followed up by with Piggy perfectly masking the defense matrix here so that the stun gets eaten. From the offense's point of view, that's what you want, right? This tank is able to pocket their DPS, whereas the D.Va can't really do much to stop this to save Tayo to get value, right? Whereas if you bubbled him right then, you'd get charge and you would still do the same thing and be able to react. Ultimately, the cool thing about this meta is that if you have a hero that you can send on the map to go get value, they will work. And the problem with the shock setup here is that it's almost anticipating all the value to be in front of them. Choi is manipulating the front line, but is anybody marking that same position that <laughs> the Doomfist was just going to take repeatedly? It's like the whole team's shocked. Look at that point of view. Like no one is there to peel for Hydration's flank. So it just comes off for free. That just can't happen. This is why I think it's easiest to explain this meta about being tempo, the defining factor of it. Whereas previously, other metas maybe were more about your teamwork positioning, being greedy for ground, ultimate economy. A lot of these other things were emphasized more. Those all still matter, but it's more about 
realizing what the quick tempo gains for the enemy are going to be and combat them instantly. We should have known, if you don't see the Doomfist, where is he going to go? The highest possible point on the map that gifts him a great seismic slam, of course he's going to go this way. Now, the way you outplay this from the Shock's point of view is play like the Houston Outlaws were playing. Why are we not aggressively going this way? If we're going to send our D.Va to play on the front line, we have to abuse the fact that Houston is sending a flank, which by the way, later on in the series, we are going to see evidence of this. Krusty found out and figured out that Houston were taking these risks, going for greedy map positions, because that's what this should be. If you have a teammate that's off in no man's land, this should be a harder fight to win. But if the shock don't take the initiative, they just lose. That's the benefit of it being a tempo meta. The team that plays passively and tries to react and the enemy sets up a play on you, well, you just lose every single time. As this fight extends, we're going to see a lot of examples of both teams trying to fight for tempo by using aggressive abilities to either gain space or convert further eliminations and keep themselves in charge. That's what tempo is all about. It's like you spend something early to gain advan an advantage that you hope is going to snowball as opposed to trying to make the highest value abilities. It's the difference between grabbing one target in order to confirm the kill quickly now as opposed to grabbing the entire team, let's say, for the biggest possible combo. The time it takes for you to to wait for those big value plays means if they go for a tempo play in this meta and i think just overwatch in general moving forward to overwatch 2 you're gonna lose like there's no point to wait that long to attempt for a higher value play now that being said striker i think is a little bit greedy on this angle and could have played more passive on the cart baiting them out into the open because i mean what what's houston gonna do they are they gonna come to cart eventually he actually didn't need to go for that but that's fine you can see then Nero decides, all right, my buddy's all in. We're going all in. Striker died for the cause. It's time to drop the blizzard, despite this fight going kind of crazy. All the while, Violet's not even back yet. They're down a healer. Okay, we're getting into caster territory. It's getting hard to keep up. So Dante picks off the high noon, but the blizzard is going to catch the main tank. And Wall's trying to save uh, somebody, but the tank's going to die. And we're going to see Houston on the defense convert some of these kills, but realize that they're not winning necessarily, trying to win, get the sound barrier out of FD God, who is attempting to counter the uh, blizzard, which a bunch of frags come on board and Juby says, all right, fine, we're staying in this fight too. I mean, that's a really greedy tempo, right? Using a support ult now when it doesn't look like you really could win the fight. But the thing is like keeping alive for map control matters so much that, all right, they, they can't push for these few seconds. We're gonna force these cooldowns out, force out the lamp, force out that escape. We don't get that kill. So Juby makes the correct read. All right, it's time to get the heck out of there. But all the while the cart hasn't been moving. So. Although I think Sound Barrier is the trickiest ult to try to sneak in on the tempo, it doesn't really hurt them as long as they get out. And the Shock have a tough predicament here. They're low on numbers too, right? It's not like they can just rush in and confirm these eliminations easily. There's a chance that they could have the fight turned on them, which now again, Crimzo goes for another tempo play, ulting during the regroup just to try to apply more pressure. This makes the cart very difficult to push. Remember, this is the last stand. This is what we really want as the defense because it's so close to our spawn, we can really abuse having this space. So this ult gets no kills, but it forces a regroup and the cart's gonna stop. And the longer we have it stop, the it eventually is gonna start moving back, which makes our defense easier and easier. So although that looks like two support ults that didn't do a whole lot, now we have a regroup and we'll see how this plays out after that point. This section is going to be so useful to you in your Overwatch game sense because so much of this is just where you position in these crucial moments in order to really max maximize the high ground and the delay on the cart. So, in theory, Shock did not burn as many ults, so they should have a bit of an advantage here, right? Working up to their window. But we're going to use some delay tactics in order to slow them down. Maywall makes the poke kind of expensive, and we're sending Choi to cart in order to try to push it. Houston Outlaws, as soon as it gets to where the imagined yellow box would be for the checkpoint, we're going to want to send one player there who 
shouldn't die immediately like diva durable has matrix can stagger the cart to deal with that meanwhile be greedy for the high ground that window fire strike kind of needed to hit something to make a big play but it does make the space and counters are a high noon the shock have the right idea but all they gain from going up now is the high ground which you say okay well that's step one right that's what they need to win they don't just need the high ground. They need to convert eliminations. Otherwise, the cart stall is going to come through. Piggy, who has the self-destruct, is going to zone the cart anyway. So they don't get it. They can't cap. They have to leave. Otherwise, they'll just die. Meanwhile, that acted as like a tanking mechanism, remembering that Piggy was the one who was stalling the objective. So using that as an extra life meant that they had more sustain overall. And now by the time they want to come down to try to win the game, it's like, well, you can't. You can't go down to cart now. You already lost someone. And it's not like anyone was in position to confirm a kill. This is what I think makes you master the meta right now is finding the gaps to go cash in eliminations. And if you don't do it aggressively and the enemy team does, well, then you're down players and you just lose. And it, it's instant. It's so fast the way it happens. So we're sending our objective players, our tanks down to stall. Happy, the absolute <laughs> Chad walks into the self-destruct, right? That could have killed him, but so what? It's time to cash in an elimination, even if he dies there. Even if he dies there, someone's got to make that play because the cart is in respawn stall territory, right? The enemy have to come kill us in order to secure this objective. And they are spending resources, whether it's ammo or ultimates or whatever, to work down our front line. But that's only the first part of the battle. The front line is made to be able to withstand that beating. You break Django's shield, you pop Piggy's mech. Piggy uses self-destruct anyway to get another one. And in the meantime, Happy secures that kill on Choi. So what was the only thing Shot could have done to convert this? Where is the kill on Houston's, Houston's side that the Shot could have exploited? Does anybody see it? Does anybody find the player who needed to die, okay? Who had to go down in order for the Shock to turn this fight? Why the heck is McCree allowed to survive on the high ground? Why, Shock? One mini diva goes down. The other mini diva stays alive. Why are we afraid of charging at Happy here? Dropping down to cart now does not win the game. Unless you did it right when the shield was down for Jangu, then maybe you can shatter the cart instantly and overwhelm the fight with swings and whatnot. But half the team's already dropping to go fight all the, these are all the most durable targets of the enemy team. Dangu, Piggy, Dante. They all have defenses that stop them from dying, which makes them great to stall the cart. Only one of them has to touch it with their I can't die mechanic. Now, defenses aren't strong in Overwatch, but you want to put them on the cart to stall it. You need your offenses to stop this guy because if he's not dead, then he he's just able to swing the fight. And moreover, stop your carries from swinging the fight back. We're shooting a shield. What's Happy doing? Like clockwork, team fight over, right? It, it happens so fast. You may not even have noticed this as these team fights are going on, but it, it's so simple. Just rush at the elimination. That's the point. Someone has to do it. It doesn't have to be your whole team. You don't need everybody necessarily to do it, but someone's got to be a playmaker in this meta. Otherwise, you go for these structured fights and there just isn't enough defenses to go around, right? What stops this? If we let's, let's look at it the other way, okay? If we don't want to go at it from an aggressive point of view, if we want to play on cart, how, how do we stop this happy flank from working? There's two ways. Either Striker marks it, but I think that's a little tough because you can't see it coming. More than likely though, you would send your off tank to eat this, right? Choi with Matrix can eat the stun and knock him back and, and mark it. And then maybe we can go for the shatter play, but you don't have a D.Va. They just died, right? So the only way you're going to turn this is by going up top. 
Onto Anubis now. This is the map where the reverse sweep began for the San Francisco Shock. Well, the attempt anyway. And it starts off with Happy trying out his patented uh, play style of aggressively going for picks. And I emphasize that because it's a big difference between frontline pressure, which he just ignores the Reinhardt there, which kind of odd, super drops his shield, to be honest. Uh, it finally kind of felt like it was left high, high and dry, but Happy gaining this position up top is the difference maker that we're going to see the shock adjust to the next time they get to defend that. Really big fast forward now. The shock had a basically equally successful attack, just a little bit less. Time bank thins down to two minutes. They do not complete in overtime on B, so will only get three points with some progress. Now it's Houston's turn to attempt to finish out the game by capping both points, but they'll need to do it in a similar way because they are playing the Hanzo, whose job it is to scale up these walls and try to find value. Do you notice the difference in... Happy's ability to find the targets to fight here? What's the huge thing that has changed? Well, up against the sniper character, the Shock decide to completely change their game plan and play faster underneath. Happy can't kill your whole team by sniping if you just run at them and kill his team first. So there are some windows for Happy to hit his shots, but since he's a sniper character and not the McCree, you can abuse it by... that. Th there's no stun on the enemy team. It's going to stop you by running in. So that's what the Shock end up doing. They start tossing in the hammer swings here with the May Wall and force out these resources early. That lamp com comes through. I don't even know if Violet's going to need a lamp. And... Well, you, you walled off your team, Dante, but you walled off the enemy's team, but uh, there, it's more like you're trapped in here with them. Uh, the enemy's lamp comes in much later, and the later lamp means that this brawl is just going to win. And meanwhile, Happy wasn't really able to find any of those kills, and that shot calling difference to then read that there is a vulnerability that you can aggress into is the major difference of why Happy wasn't able to do anything. Only 24 ult charge here is going to get an exit pick, but doesn't really uh, amount to too much on a character that's going to be able to come back really quickly. Now into the next fight, because the Shock won the previous one, you can see they have lots of ults available or coming online before the Outlaws are going to. So that means this fight can be even easier if they just cash in their ults aggressively. Happy is up top looking for the picks, dumping the Storm Arrow. Dante is going to try to punish this aggression with the Maywall, but really it's on Happy to get a kill here because he's not providing the same CC against the Rush that McCree would have. The wall is somewhat successful, kind of an odd wall here, but, and I, I am going to point out the... Uh, lamp usage here granted may have thought that that earth shatter was going to land and we needed to use the lamp but because violet is able to knock down the wall and then put up that early amplification matrix crimzo not even close to his or oh, pretty close but not going to get his in this fight essentially that just means now we have the later lamp forced out by our aggression and then an ultimate so the automatically you just have to seed this space houston have to run there's no way that they're going to have a chance to fight this almost getting their own window now this is going to be the difference that they can leverage. Though, Shock is also then going to come up with a bunch of ults they can respond with. Nero, counterplay on the window again. This is the major way you're going to stop this from catching your team out. It's like uh, the Maywall is essentially another Rhine shield, right? This is just counters that surprise factor. And they're not really able to get the kills out of this window that you would have liked because you've got Nero and Super playing Hodor, holding the door down. Dante does shoot through it to get Violet, but this is going to be a much more expensive fight for the Outlaws than they want. FD God pops the sound barrier. Super goes in aggressively, and the Outlaws are essentially going to panic at this point. There's 30 seconds left, so they feel they have to pop all these ults just to have a chance to win this, because they have to not only win A, but go all over to B and cap it all the way, basically. So, Blizzards come down from Dante, and that's almost enough to seal their fate, in my opinion, because Nero is going to be coming up on his, which is going to be the difference maker on B. Remember, the Shock very intelligent in these types of situations typically like they know when they can afford to do an econ push which that's what that was essentially into the enemy to drain out some ultimates and quite a few came out they will end up getting a for this but they can almost guarantee that they won't get b 
because how do you beat a blizzard? It's it's pretty tough. So Anubis for me in a nutshell was one from a combination of playing fast underneath the sniper so that they can't keep up with the pace that you're fighting their team. But also then when you have that ultimate advantage, you have to press it in order to make the enemy over ult. The exchange of those resources aggressively too comes in in big clutch and a lot of good walls from Nero in order to slow down the enemy's attack. The Matrix comes down, freezing the D.Va. That's the key way you're gonna make that play. And when you do this, I mean, they can't even touch the point hardly. That's just stellar May play from Nero, who is a big pickup coming in from the Guangzhou charge. If you haven't seen him play in the East, he was pretty dominant on flex there as well. Perhaps not as good as Rascal, but I mean, you can't ask for more out of your D.Va. This is everything you want. Half the team is zoned up by this wall. The D.Va can't eat the ultimate because she's frozen, oh, comes down in between, and what are you gonna do? Walk through this blizzard in order to touch point? I mean, the, the whole game's won just from that one player having that key ultimate at a key time. I think Altlaz maybe would have wanted to launch Piggy's ult into the back earlier while that was going on in order to make a bit more space and punish uh, the, the Shock's defense, but little, too little too late. So this round, the Shock finally start to get in the groove of how the meta needs to be played. I feel like they smell blood in the water and are starting to really pressure the Outlaws as they try to attempt these split formations. You send a DPS on an off angle, they'll generally win unless you punish it. And that's what they do on this very first fight where they see a bunch of the Outlaws on the high ground. Shock have point control. Spy checking for the Somber right now to try to deny the hack. But as soon as they see this split, you can see how FT God was holding amp this whole time, waiting for that ability to isolate a target. The rush is able to come through and Happy is just going to get run over and there's nothing they can do. Beautiful Maywall is going to slow down any help that he may have gotten. And just a bad rotation from Happy, really. I, I'm kind of confused why he felt he had to drop down like that, considering he's playing with a Sombra, not a May. You would think he would might stay up top or, uh, you know, where he's safe. But they decide to go down to the point. And this is the read you need to make every time. I think what they were attempting is to trap into a hack. Now that I look at this again, this must have been the game plan. This is the only reason why Happy would go this way is because they were attempting to lure that hack right there that he went for, but it got canceled. And that means this whole death ball can speed on you. This is just never what you want to see. You don't, you never want to see your star player fight five. <laughs> I mean, something has gone terribly wrong if that's the case, right? Okay, final section of the game. The attack was interesting too. The outlaws were struggling a bit with a tracer versus double sniper on the best sniper map in the game, but they, didn't even cap A, so this should have been a very winnable situation for the Shock, but I think it came down to running this comp that was just really weird. I don't think I've seen a team try to run BAP Ana yet, and this is kind of why, because the problem is you sort of just take a lot of poke, do a lot of healing, but can't really convert anything. Twilight's actually going to get some outrageously powerful anti-nades, in this attacking side, but we all know how it ends up near the end, right? So the outlaws, how the heck do they even win this fight? That doesn't even make sense, right? When the anti gets landed like that. But the truth is the team that has the Lucio, their front line is able to position so much better and always get away from danger or reposition or create these crossfires. And we're trying to bunker up in our own lamp, but the faster team just can play more active and surround smurf has 36 ult charge and jangu has his earth shatter already that's partially because piggy is on the diva and choi is on the orisa so one team can eat fire strikes the other team can't easy earth shatter now granted we do get a kill as the attacking side here so dante's not gonna be able to hold but the defense just wants to be able to delay the cart as long as possible. So we're gonna stay here, down a man, and just try our best to hold the objective so that we can get multiple fights and retakes, which is a classic strategy you can go for when you have a Lucio teammate. The enemy doesn't have a Lucio, so our regroups are gonna be more effective. So even our losing fights are more valuable 
than the enemies because our regroups are going to be better just because we have speed boost. So here the team's already starting to come back and the cart is getting to the corner, which this is so important. Isn't this basically where you would have defended anyway? That's why taking that free fight there and speeding back is so worth it because the cart gets to the corner with a minute and a half drained off. Not to mention the outlaws have got ults to work with, which means their trading and everything is going to be so much better. So just such a much more powerful way to play the map, in my opinion. Looking at this from the other perspective, it's a little bit heartbreaking as the May and uh, Ana attempt to set up a little trap here. Somebody wakes up that Lucio, which should have been probably the entire map, to be honest, as soon as you get that. Because if the Lucio was dead, they wouldn't be able to get this sound barrier off, which stalls the cart more. And we're just touching the payload. That's all the defense is doing. It's just touching cart. It's just such an outrageous thing. Not to mention the other big play, the thing that secures this entire map. Happy wins the stun battle on the outside lurking. So important that Glister goes down there. Reason being is because remember how we talked about on Blizzard World, the things that are going to secure you eliminations to actually get the cart across the finish line is your damage. You need ways to eliminate the enemy in order to stop their stall. Otherwise, the defenses are going to be able to hold the cart for quite a long time, and that's going to happen. This is probably, I, I honestly think this is the worst possible trade that the shot could take. I'd rather anyone else from the shot go down here other than Glister, because Glister is the punching power to finish the targets that are going to be touching the cart. So much hard, it's going to be so much harder to do considering your tanks don't have speed. Neither does your Mei. And then we put down a Mei wall, which is going to zone out most of this window. And we can use our speed a little bit to get around. Window's not getting nearly as much. And again, we have this problem where this really goatsy, like, brawl line can speed and get the positioning they want. Blizzard catches out Smurf. He can't get away. No amp to get out of there. Both tanks frozen. Striker tries to clutch the fight with a Blizzard, but who's the important thing? Like, like there's no damage being done. There's, there's no damage. There's no damage. How, how do we deal damage to anything? Right? S Striker has to hide from the Blizzard himself. He's the other damage character and like, you know, May's barely a damage to be honest. Damage in role, technically, in name. But without Glister, how do we finish anything off? The window can do it, but the enemy's May wall counters it. So that offense is gone. Can't get away from this blizzard. And Twilight's going to try his best to land a godly nade. But what's the point? What's the point of that nade? Oh, they're all, they're all anti. Oh, let's uh, quick. Betsy speed boost us in. In the mix of this, Django gets a kill. Which is kind of the difference maker as well. After all of that craziness, maybe we still would have been able to win it on the attacking side. Oh, Django blocks the shatter and fire strikes Violet. Are you kidding me? What a madman. Oh, that's insane. Piggy holding on to self-destruct again just to stall the objective. And, and that's all she wrote, right? Like, parrying back, defending. The team that can play defense with defending characters, that's what you want alive, right? If you're on attack, you need offense to finish the enemy. If you're on defense, then you can get by with your McCree in spawn because really you're, you can hold out until that respawn comes back. So these delay tactics with speed and the, the brawly rush characters surviving on cart again stalls out the objective down to a minute. I mean, this is stuff Shock should know. They won the league during Coats meta. You think they'd be able to understand these principles? Uh, they definitely do, but speed boost onto Happy. Catches out Choi's mech. One amp on the high noon. One amp uh, missing on the enemy. Means a major positional advantage. And here again, Jangu makes what I think is like secretly low key the play that won the map. Because as soon as I saw this snipe 
hit the back, I'm like, oh my god, they don't have speed. There's no way that they're going to effectively get a good fight again. The game's over. Because the enemy having Blizzard and you having Blizzard, and you have speed and they don't, unless you eat the enemy's Blizzard, how are you going to confirm the kills on the cart? What are you going to do? So you have to wait all this time to get the last few seconds. And again, we're going to have a Blizzard trade. But when one team has speed and the other doesn't, one Blizzard is more effective than the other. Big Anti on Jangu. Striker going aggressive. Dante on top of the May wall. This is such a devastating wall. Half the team can't see anything. So the wall and the and the little bit of Lucio support and the lamp saves Jangu with a nick of health. All of their cooldowns are blown to finish this guy. But instead, he makes the read in the chaos, getting to the side of the fight. In the blizzard, through the fire and the flames, through the frost <laughs> and the snow and the sleet and the rain and all the other elements. Finds the shatter in the back. Piggy finally launches that aggressive diva bomb. I've been uh, saying he should just do uh, in these hectic fights, especially when there's, again, I, 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 how many times I got to say it? <laughs> Being able to move out of the way of a lot of these insta-kill abilities, it's pretty good. So that's all she wrote. That's the end of this absolutely epic Houston Outlaws match. Let me know your thoughts in the breakdown. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave it with a like. It really does help us out. Let's us know that you're enjoying the content. If you haven't already, hit subscribe and be sure to hit the bell icon so you actually get notified when our videos go live directly to your cell phone. Find out when our videos are going out. Linked in the description is our Twitter where you can say hi to us, talk about the Overwatch League, check out how bad my uh, calls are on the team's power rankings and whatnot. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. We'll see you guys next time.